Hey, what's up? My name is Scott Whitley. I'm the founder of Faithful Word Ministries. The mission of Faithful Word Ministries is to promote biblical literacy among the body of Christ through the serious study of God's awesome word. All endeavors to represent our coming team with competence. Today's video is part six in our progression through John. This is chapter 10, verse three to chapter 13, verse 15. Welcome to part six. These are the nine layers that we attempt to unpack so we can understand the context of what God's trying to communicate to us. This is the definition of those nine layers that we attempt to unpack so we can understand the context of what God wants to communicate to us. <clears throat> Beloved, remember, God's name has volumes written about it in, the, in Scripture. Okay, God decided to put his name in Jerusalem. Okay, He put his name there. But there's one thing in the text that God puts above his own name. That's his word, Psalm 138, 2. <clears throat> says, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God puts his word above his own name. So what priority should we place on God's word? These are the two verses that led to my conversion. This, beloved, is where God promised to preserve his word forever. Believing these two verses, taking God at his word, will save you a lifetime of doubt and discouragement. Okay? The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Why seven times? Seven is the biblical number of completeness. God puts seven days in a complete week. The silver or gold uh, refining process is a process where they would take a, a metal like gold or silver. They would heat it to liquid and the impurities would rise to the top and then they'd scrape it off. The point of the process is not to destroy it, but to purify the gold or the silver. So they would repeat this process seven times. That's how they were able to stamp 99.9% .9 pure bullion on top of the gold or silver. Okay. Verse seven, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them. The them is the words of the Lord from verse six. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation for a hundred years. That's not what it says. It says forever. God promised to preserve his word forever. This is awesome. And so this is where our story takes place. On the left, we have the kingdom of Judah. So if you remember the kingdom of Israel, idiomatically called the Northern Kingdom, they were defeated by the Assyrians in 722. There was no remnant left of the Northern Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom had many dynasties, whereas the kingdom of Judah, where our story takes place uh, for the book of Jeremiah, only had one dynasty, the Davidic dynasty. Now, the reason God allowed a remnant to be preserved out of the Southern Kingdom was because of his promise to David. This is how we know God's not finished with Israel. Another way, uh, or another important, uh, important fact to remember is that God is not finished with Israel. The angel Gabriel told the Virgin Mary that her, her child would, quote, be given the throne of his father David. Okay, when Jesus was born, there was no Davidic throne. David was dead and gone. That was yet future. God is not finished with Israel by any means. They still have a major part to play. There's a distinction between Israel and the church. The church does not replace Israel. Israel and the church have different origins, missions, and destinies. So the map on the right is where our story takes place in Jerusalem. And just by way of review, there are th so we can keep all the details straight, I'm going to repeat some things a bunch of times, but I want us to be able to keep things straight in our head. So there were three sieges, the first of which was in 605 BC. That's when that was the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar. That's when Daniel and his three buddies get deported, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the book of Daniel was written uh, in Babylon. Okay, The second siege or deportation was in 598 to 597 BC. Keep in mind, BC years are going backward in time. Okay, And Ezekiel was deported during the second siege, and he wrote his book, Ezekiel, in Babylon. Okay, The third siege uh, was from 588 to 586. This was the third, siege of, uh, third and final siege of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Jeremiah was... We could say he was deported in the third siege, but Jeremiah had great favor. Okay, He was not in captivity. He had great freedom to come and go as he pleased. God took care of Jeremiah because Jeremiah carried out God's will for his life. Okay, So our story in Jeremiah occurs and is written during this time period. And by the way, in this presentation, when you see the abbreviated words N-E-B-U, Nebu, or Neb, N-E-B, it stands for Nebuchadnezzar. So just by way of review, the third siege is about 19 years after the first. These two 70-year periods are not coterminous or collinear. In other words, they don't have the same start and end date, okay, but they do overlap. 
So the first 70 year period is called the servitude of the nations. Okay, it began with the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar and ended with the decree of Cyrus in 537 BC. The second 70 year period is called the desolations of Jerusalem. It began with the third siege, third and final siege of Nebuchadnezzar, and it ended with the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus on March 14, 445 BC. This is the fourth decree. This is the decree, the fourth one, that triggers Daniel 9.25, which says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, now the words from and, and to and until in scripture are very important. So let's pay attention to from and unto. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince, or the triumphal entry, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So from the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until the triumphal entry. Okay, that's the distinction that's being made here. Okay. So Artaxerxes authorizes Nehemiah to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the entire city, not just the wall or the temple, but the entire city. And all of these kings were sons of Josiah. So we have King Josiah. Now, Jeremiah prophesied during the reign of all five of these kings. Now, Ezekiel's career didn't start until uh, around the time Eliakim is renamed Jehoiakim. But Jeremiah prophesied during the reigns of Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, who was formerly Eliakim, but he had his name changed to Jehoiakim. Okay, Jehoiakim's son is Jehoiachin. Kim is the father, Chin is the son. Jehoiachin is the one that God places the blood curse on in Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 30, where God says, Write ye this man childless. Now, he already had sons when God said that, but that meant that he would never have a son to rule uh, on the throne because of his wickedness. So God put a blood curse on him. And it's interesting. How in the world do we get a Messiah when God puts a blood curse on the male royal Davidic messianic line? <laughs> Two words, virgin birth. Okay, that's how God gets around it. Satan probably thought God shot himself in the foot when he did it, when he put a blood curse on the male Davidic line. Okay, so Ezekiel started prophesying during the reign of Jehoiakim, and he prophesied even after the fall of Jerusalem. So this is the verse we left, uh, or that we ended on uh, last time in part five. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse two. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen and be not dismayed at the signs of the heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. So the nations were afraid of the planetary motions that they saw, signs in the heavens. When God created the universe, he created stars and left them in various constellations. You and I know these constellations by their Babylonian names. And everybody's heard of the term Zodiac. Zodiac is the English word for the Hebrew word Maseroth. Okay, Maseroth. So the names of the stars are the same in every language. The names are surprisingly the same throughout secular cultures. If you know the Hebrew names of the Zodiac or Maseroth, and you know the names of the high magnitude stars in Hebrew, you discover something really interesting. It's the gospel laid out in advance before the Tower of Babel was built. So this brings up the oldest prophecy in Scripture. In the very small book of Jude, Jude was the Lord's half-brother. Jude's only 25 verses. It's one chapter. The Lord's half-brother, Jude, quotes Enoch, who lived in Genesis 5 time frame, talking about the second coming of Christ. How in the world does Enoch, who lived in Genesis 5, know about the second coming of Christ? Listen to Jude, verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. This isn't talking about the harpazo, because during the rapture, Jesus comes back for the church. At the second coming, he comes back with the church. This is talking about the second coming. It says, The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. This is the second coming. How in the world does Enoch know about the second coming of Christ when he lived in Genesis 5? Okay, well, this is how he knew. Enoch lived in Genesis 5 time frame. So how in the world would Enoch know about the second coming of Christ all the way back in Genesis 5? <laughs> okay, so the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints is talking about the second coming. Okay, so the gospel laid out in the stars for all to see is one way that Enoch knew. The gospel was laid out in the stars. If you take the stars in order of their brightness, which is also called magnitude, it presents the Christian gospel. Now, this was perverted at the Tower of Babel, okay, when they instituted astrology and started 
mixing witchcraft with uh, astronomy. Okay, then they started using astrology. If you take the 10 names given in Genesis 5, the same 10 names that are given in the text, and realize the meaning of those names, it too presents the Christian gospel. This is incredible. Okay, the first 10 men that ever lived, Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalio, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, the one that was the oldest, okay, 969 years, I think, Lamech and Noah. That's the first 10 men that lived in creation, okay, the first 10 men, period, okay? Now, the scripture gives the definition of these names. Adam means man, Seth means appointed, Enos means mortal, Canaan means sorrow, Mahalio means the blessed God, Jared means shall come down, Enoch means teacher or teaching, Methuselah means his death shall bring, because remember, there was a prophecy saying that when Methuselah died, it was going to bring a flood, and that's exactly what happened. So Methuselah means his death shall bring, Lamech means the despairing, and Noah means rest or comfort. So we read the definition of the names in order without adding any words. It says, man appointed mortal sorrow, the blessed God shall come down, teaching his death shall bring the despairing rest or comfort. This is the Christian gospel tucked away in a genealogy in Genesis 5. Most of the time when we read a genealogy, we tend to skip through it because it's like so-and-so, we got so-and-so, we got so-and-so. We're like, okay. So God leaves a, a trail of bread comes for us to find, beloved, just like in Hebrews 11, 6, is that God rewards his diligent seekers. And I got this from a Chuck Missler's Genesis audio commentary and probably some other one of his commentaries. I've seen this several times, but he was the one that presented this. So the gospel was laid out in the stars before the Tower of Babel. And the meaning of the names in the Hebrew for the first 10 men that were alive on earth held tremendous meaning. So God's plan for man was laid out in the stars, and this is before creation in Genesis 1. The stars were created before there were people on earth to notice it. So um, some atheists will claim that Christianity borrowed stories from other cultures and peoples, but that is absolutely false. Okay, The gospel was laid out in the stars before there were people on earth to look at it. Okay, The stars were given names by Adam. And that was the mechanism by which father to son would describe what was coming. Okay. The concept of a deliverer born of a virgin. Okay. This is the gospel. The concept of a deliverer born of a virgin. That's what Virgo is or was. Okay. So the Zodiac was perverted at the Tower of Babel when they introduced witchcraft into astronomy and created astrology. Okay. That's what horoscopes are. Okay. Uh, very dangerous. So it happens that the solar system in those days was still unstable. And there's a lot of evidence to support the fact that some of the planets came very close to Earth in their orbital trajectories. Okay? They passed really close to Earth at that time. Okay? This is why Jonathan Swift in his book, Gulliver's Travels, can describe the size and planetary motions of the two moons of Mars when they were not officially discovered by telescope until 150 years later. So there were times these two moons passed by Earth so closely that they were visible to the naked eye, which means that there were major disruptions on planet Earth. In addition, these near passes towards Earth were predictable by the ancients. They would plan their battles around them. That's why, if you remember, the Assyrians, the Assyrians encamped around the hills of Jerusalem. Okay, So if you remember, the Assyrians were hoping that those tremors that we talked about before would bring down uh, Jerusalem's defense walls. OK, and there are signs in the sky and several ways to look at them. So the nations are fought today are following the Babylonian system, which is corrupted by Satan, starting at the Tower of Babel onward. Keep in mind that Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, 2, that Satan is a prince of the power of the air. And it's very interesting that in Revelation, the sealed trumpet and bowl judgments or bowls are also called vials. But the sealed trumpet and bowls are all poured out in the air. Okay, Satan's the prince of the power of the air. God's going upside of Satan's head, which is great. So the significance is that this is that this is Satan's corruption of the signs that were put there by God for his purposes. Okay, and Satan perverted it like he does everything else. Has he not perverted the family? Has he perverted marriage? In time, he will pervert anything. Okay, in time, he will pervert anything and everything. So the ancients were afraid of the signs of the heavens for very good reason, because it interfered with their lives. 71 BC was the last orbital pass by for the planet Mars. After that, their orbit stabilized. 
So this has to do with orbital resonance, and you can chase this topic down more so if you like. A number of competent scholars have written comprehensively on this topic. So the point is that up until 701 BC, the Earth got along fine with a 360-day calendar. And there are 14 ancient cultures that had a 360-day calendar leading up to 701 BC. Something happened that year to cause all of them to correct their calendars. The Romans added four and a quarter days. The Hebrews added a whole month every third year, approximately. And the rabbis argue about Hezekiah changing the Hebrew calendar, but they never discuss why Hezekiah had to change the calendar in the first place. Okay, Why didn't the calendar work in 702 BC or 703 BC and, and so on? So this was the last major flyby of Mars and her two moons. So the NASA scientists that published a book on this pointed out that the biblical catastrophes appear to be in 106 year periods. They built computer models and came up with what they call the Mars hypothesis. Okay. Then they discovered the statement in Jonathan Swift's book, Gulliver's Travels, about Mars orbital flyby and recognized that Mars and her two moons were not discovered officially until 150 years later. Now, the verse that we're on is Jeremiah 10, 2. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of the heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Okay, listen to what God told the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 45, verses 11 and 12. It says, Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his Maker. Okay, there's another reference to the Godhead. God says, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. I have made the earth. God wants us, to, he tells us to ask him what our questions are. We don't have to go to witchcraft and use sorcery. We can ask God directly. Then he says, I have made the heavens. God credentials himself as creator clearly all through the book of Isaiah and Psalms and everywhere else. God says, I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. Okay, it doesn't get any clearer than this. This is why we should not get involved in witchcraft, horoscopes, or the devil's entertainment. Not all entertainment is the devil's, but God gives us discernment and we're to use that discernment. So music and movies either promote God's agenda or Satan's agenda. There is no middle ground. Okay. The psalmist says in Psalm 1013, God said, or the psalmist said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. So God wants us to ask him about things we don't know or understand. Now, God may, may very well use a person to answer our question, but we need to take our question straight to God. Okay. God will never leave us in doubt. When we seek him for our answers, okay, all three members of the Godhead implore us to seek him, okay, Isaiah 118, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, the Lord Jesus, and John 5, 39, search the scriptures, okay, John 14, 26, Jesus speaks on behalf of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit doesn't speak of himself, he's spoken for, 1426 in John is where Jesus introduces the Comforter, saying, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Here's a verse that tells us God will teach us all things and bring all things to our remembrance whatsoever I, Jesus, have said unto you. Okay, it doesn't get any clearer. This doesn't say anything about a school or a degree, a piece of paper, it doesn't say nothing about that. Okay, if we seek the Lord through serious Bible study, he will, quote, teach us all things he already promised to. So before we get into this week's new content, let's have a word of prayer and ask God's help in our study today. Lord, thank you so much for your awesome word. Lord, I pray that you would help Christians around the world that are really suffering in places that are hostile to the gospel, like China, Afghanistan, Iran. I pray for those Christians that are really going through something terrible, whether it's financial or relationship or addiction wise. Um, Father, I pray that you would help those that are really hurting, those marriages that need help, those relationships and friendships that need help. And thank you, God, for healing broken hearts. Thank you for healing relationships. Thank you for healing people and old wounds and hurts and pains. Thank you so much, Lord, for promising to preserve this book down through the ages. And thank you for doing just that. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to learn something we didn't already know. I pray that there be no technical difficulties, Lord, or distractions. Thank you so much, Lord, for standing behind your awesome word so we can stand on it. I love you, Lord. We give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 3. 
for the customs of the people are vain. For one cut of the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. So the customs of the people are vain. This is no surprise. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. Okay. The result is the work of their hands. They get it, they cut it, they trim it, they deck it out, they fasten it with nails so it doesn't move. He later points out that since the idol is nailed, is nailed down, it can't carry you anywhere. It can't help you because it's nailed to the floor. Your God is nailed to the floor. Okay, that's pathetic. Your God is nailed to the floor. This is ridiculous that somebody would worship something that's made of wood and stone that's nailed to the floor. That's pathetic. So he presents these idols, these pathetic idols, as being bulky baggage. Verse 5, they are upright as the palm tree, but they speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. So they must be born. Born means carried. Okay. So his argument here is that the idol can't do you any harm physically, and it can't do you any good either. And we know from the Old Testament that the book of Revelation, or in the book of Revelation, that when somebody worships an idol, they're actually worshiping Satan. Okay. Palm trees were trimmed into phallic shapes. The groves are where they would practice the ancient Canaanite fertility rituals, which was orgies, and it even involved children. Okay, that's documented. So behind these idols are demonic powers. That's what is called an entry, E-N-T-R-Y, an entry. Okay, possession always begins, it, th that process starts when a demon is invited. And a Christian cannot be possessed, but a Christian can definitely be oppressed by demons. Okay. Interacting with an idol is inviting demonic activity. It's extremely dangerous. Don't think for a minute that Ouija boards and tarot cards are harmless fun or harmless superstition. They are not. They're extremely dangerous. Okay. They are definitely not harmless and can cause significant supernatural evil in your life. You can get something conjured attached to you that will not leave until you're dead. That's the whole point of possession is to kill the host and take the soul to hell. That's the whole point. The movie The Exorcist was based on a true story. The demons gained entry via the teenager's Ouija board downstairs on the ping pong table. This movie was based on a true story. William Peter Blatty's 1973 movie The Exorcist was based on a true story. That's true. The real story involved a little boy, though, not a little girl. But the content is factual. Okay. Demons gained entrance into the house through a personal invitation via a Ouija board downstairs on the ping pong table. Okay, God told us to ask him what's to come, okay? Not to seek knowledge through witchcraft or communicating with the dead. There are consequences for doing that. You can get something attached to you that will not leave. Nine people associated with the movie The Exorcist died during its production. The actor Jack McGowan gets killed in the movie and he died as soon as he completed filming his parts, okay? Max Francito's brother died. The assistant cameraman's wife also had a baby during filming, and it died during filming. The baby died. The man who refrigerated the set died. They built an enormous freezer to house the bedroom scene in so they could capture cold breath coming out of the priest's mouth, okay? A young night watchman died during filming, and these casualties were not from stunts. These were people that just dropped dead. Okay, nine people altogether drop dead. Beloved, we cannot fathom Satan's ability to deceive us. Okay, he's much smarter than we are. He's not smarter than God is, but he's much smarter than we are. And remember that Satan is the Lord's devil. Satan's mind is wide open before the Lord. Just like I can look at my computer here, it's a touch screen, and I can fan through pages and uh, tabs that I have open, and I can look through and see what's where. God can do the same thing. Okay, Satan's mind is wide open before the Lord. Before Satan can act, God knows about it. God knows what he's going to do. Okay. Verse 6, For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. So God's name has volumes written about it. But the one thing God puts above his own name is his word. Psalm 138.2 says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. 
who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdoms there is none like unto thee. Verse 8. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish, and gold from Uphaz. The work of the workmen and of the hands of the founder, blue and purple, is their clothing. They are all the work of cunning men. So blue and purple dyes are still not trivial technologies today. I mean, you have the benefit of modern chemistry, but they didn't. Blue, purple, silver, and gold were rare resources back then. So they really put a lot into finding the best high-end materials for use in their idol construction. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. The living God is a phrase used all throughout scripture. Matthew uses it in Matthew 16, 16. And Simon Peter answered and, and said, Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Daniel, in Daniel 6, 26, this is Nebuchadnezzar speaking, says, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. Nebuchadnezzar continues, he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom is that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall, even, shall be even unto the end. So, at his wrath. The phrase at his wrath. So there were five wraths of God mentioned in scripture. Okay. Five types of wrath. So eternal wrath, which is eternity in hell. People that reject Jesus. Everybody in hell has one thing in common. They all rejected Jesus. Okay. Everybody in heaven were sinners, but they're forgiven sinners. Okay. So eternal wrath means eternity in hell. Okay. Eschatological wrath is the outpouring of God's wrath in the last days. Okay. And there's a lot in scripture about that. Calamitous wrath is like. Noah's flood, okay, when uh, God brought about Noah's flood, and then Solomon and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. So, uh, so we have eternal wrath, eschatological wrath, calamitous wrath, and then consequential wrath, okay, the natural result of bad choices, okay, God pouring out his wrath as consequences, like he's doing here with, the, uh, with Judah, the southern kingdom. And then lastly, abandonment wrath, like with Samson in Judges 16.20, okay, and King Saul in 1 Samuel 16, where uh, one of the most terrifying verses in Scripture is in Judges 16:20, and it says Samson uh, wist not, or Samson knew not, that the Lord had departed from him. That's terrifying, but beloved, that won't happen to us today. We have the advent of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if I go away, I will send him unto you. And we know for a fact he went away and did send him unto us. He's the one teaching us right here, right now, as we sit here and open God's word together. So, Keep in mind that Christians are not never, they're not and never appointed to wrath. Okay, Jesus took care of that. We will never face God's wrath, beloved. Jesus took that at the cross when he became sin for us. Second Corinthians 5, 21, Paul said, For he hath made him, that's G, or for God the Father hath made him, God the Son, to be made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus became Scott Whitley. He became you and me. So Christians are not appointed to wrath. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath. But what's he appointed us to? To obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen to that. Thus shall you say unto them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. So this is the only verse in this book, in the book of Jeremiah, that's written in Aramaic or Chaldean. Okay. The reason Jeremiah wrote it in these languages is so that they all could be on, indicted on what it says. Okay. Them is the pagan nations. Okay. In other words, our God, the living God, is going to abide forever, but their false lowercase g gods are going to rot and be destroyed. Wood, when it gets wet over time, rots. Okay. Their God is going to rot. Okay. And this is written in a language they can understand, Chaldean. He hath made the earth by his power. He established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens by his discretion. By the way, the first creation is mentioned in Proverbs 8. The first creation is wisdom. That was before Genesis 1.1. Okay. The phrase stretcheth out the heavens. So this phrase is seen all throughout scripture. 
When he uttered his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasuries. When he uttereth his voice, like the voice of many waters. Okay, now this is an Old Testament phrase, but it's also in Revelation. The water cycle is in Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Solomon even asks, why do all the rivers flow into the sea, but yet the sea is never full? Solomon was very wise. He had it figured out. Clouds, rain, and evaporation describe the water cycle, literally. Okay, man discovered the water cycle officially in the 17th century, but it was already in God's word. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image, for his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. They are vanity and the work of errors. In the time of their visitation, they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Gather up thy wares out of the land, O inhabitant of the fortress. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will sling out the inhabitants of the land at this once, and will distress them, that they may find it so. So in Jeremiah 51, we'll rediscover Jeremiah 10, verses 12 through 16 again. And he'll elaborate more on this coming up. So God's unique relationship with Israel is the theme here. God's unique relationship with Israel is the theme here. And Jeremiah expands on this shortly. Verses 1 through 16 of chapter 10 are almost a parenthetical reference or a parenthesis. From verse 17 on, it's a wrap up of what some scholars call the temple sermon by Jeremiah. This temple sermon was a speech by Jeremiah that made him extremely unpopular. They never forgave him for what he said. They hated him for what he said in the last 18 verses. But what he said was exactly what God told him to say. And beloved, there are going to be times in life where you do exactly what God wants you to do. And everybody's going to fight you. Everybody's going to fight you on it. But stay faithful. First Corinthians 4, 2 said it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Be faithful. Okay. So that speech Jeremiah made, the last 18 verses, caused major problems for him in every way. Okay, Everybody abandoned him, even his close friends. So we're going to see a dialogue between Jeremiah and Judah personified, as if Jerusalem is having a conversation with the nation of Judah as a person. Similar to the way Lamentations is written, Jeremiah also wrote Lamentations, but Lamentations is written as if Jerusalem herself was talking. Okay. So the blame for Judah's sin falls on its leadership, just like some of the blame for biblical illiteracy in churches today also falls on its leadership. Verse 19, woe is me for my hurt, my wound is grievous, but I said, truly, this is a grief and I must bear it. My tabernacle is spoiled and all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me and they are not. There is none to stretch forth my tent anymore and to set up my curtains. For the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Does that sound familiar? Therefore, they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. So pastors and shepherds here is talking about the leadership. Judah's pastors were dishonest men because they got paid to teach the people, but did not teach the people. Behold, the noise of the brute is come and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate in a den of dragons. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. So we don't ever want to ask God for, just, uh, for justice on ourselves. Okay? If we do, we're going to be in big trouble. The more you learn about God, the more you want his mercy and grace. Okay. Mercy is not getting what we deserve, which is eternity in hell. Okay. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Okay. Like God's still blessing us with good things, even though we're sinners. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not upon thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob, and devoured him, and consumed him, and have made his habitation desolate. So the interesting thing here is that man cannot decide the course of his own life. There's no way to get God's blessings without his help and his leading. Okay? Psalms 37.25 says, I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. 
What's this mean? This means that God takes care of his own. Okay, in his way, in his time. God feeds the little birds that cry and his children for that matter. Okay, he meets all of my needs. Okay. Proverbs 16, 9. A man's heart devaseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. Proverbs 20, verse 24. Man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? Also, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Okay? So we can't direct our own steps, because in the end, we'll end up in a ditch that we can't get out of. Okay, been there, done that. Okay, so this verse is recited every year at the Passover. Chapter 11. So chapters 11 through 20 shift gears big time. Okay, it's autobiographical and narrative. Okay, the text takes the form of a private diary, if you will. Okay, chapters 11 and 12 are a unit. They're together. Okay, Jeremiah 11:16 is the verse that Paul uses as a springboard in Romans 11. Jeremiah says in uh, chapter 11, verse 16, the Lord called thy name a green olive tree. Does that sound familiar? Paul picks it up and runs with it later. A green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit, with the noise of a great tumult. He hath kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. So Romans 11 is about Israel's future. Keep in mind, Romans 9, 10, and 11 is Israel's past, present, and future, respectively, okay, with breathtaking precision, okay? Romans 11, 16 and following, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. So uh, Jeremiah 9 and Roman, Romans 9 are related. And keep in mind that chapter divisions are not inspired. They were added by a man named Stephen Langton in the 12th century. So chapter 11 will set the stage for Paul's premise in which he introduces an idea that Jeremiah didn't even know about at that time. The wild dollar branch being grafted in. Okay, so we have a tendency to put prophets on a pedestal. Okay, young people tend to put older people they respect and admire and love on pedestals. Okay, when everybody is shoulder to shoulder with God, everybody has struggles. Some people's is obvious, sometimes not, but everybody struggles. Everybody has the besetting sins that they struggle with. Okay, so even prophets. So prophets were men of God that God used just like he uses me and you. They felt fear, anger, emotional pain, loneliness, rejection, anguish, grief, and everything else me and you feel. Okay? Jeremiah was very human. Okay? He experienced an emotional roller coaster delivering the message that God gave him to deliver to Judah. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Hear ye the words of the covenant, and speak unto the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, of Egypt, from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice, and do them according to all which I command you. So shall ye be my people, and I will be your God. So the iron furnace is a place where they were refined or purified, not destroyed. Okay. So this phrase is also used of the Great Tribulation, the last three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation. So the two big issues here are obey my voice and do them. The two issues, obey my voice and do them. That I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as it is this day. Then answered I and said, so be it, O Lord. So the first five verses was one sentence, okay? And what does Jeremiah have against periods? For that matter, what does Paul have against periods? Because the first seven verses of Romans 1 is one sentence, okay? It's about 80 or 90 words. It's like what? It's one sentence, okay? So Jeremiah is given the same covenant in the last four verses that God gave to Moses, okay? So this is a clear linkage in language and concept here. 
Throughout scripture, God credentials himself, and rightfully so, as the one who brought Israel out of bondage and kept them out. They didn't go back into bondage when he brought them out. God said he would do even greater things than that. Okay? The Babylonian captivity was a bigger deal than the exodus out of Egypt. And we'll see evidence of this as we continue here. Okay, So he's obviously speaking to the, quote, men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. And this curse is the same curse from Moses' covenant. If you obey my voice, you will prosper. If you disobey, you will not prosper. You will die. Okay. Uh, quote, that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers. So this phrase only occurs three times outside of the Torah, here and in Ezekiel 20. Okay. Land flowing with milk and honey is also used three times. So after this all-encompassing mandate from the Lord, what does Jeremiah say? So be it. He says, Amen, so be it. Then the Lord said unto me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and do them. For I earnestly protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. So the exodus was a really big deal. God took the Israelites out of bondage, and they never went back into bondage. God forgave the exodus generation for their sin, but we shouldn't confuse forgiveness with consequences. Yes, God forgave them. They didn't go back into bondage, but they still had to pay the consequences for their sin, which was dying outside of the promised land. They all died in the wilderness. So everybody that was over, the, I think it was 20 and upward, died in the wilderness, and everybody under 20 was able to survive, okay, and enter the promised land. So everybody from that generation had to die. That was the consequences. So God did forgive the children of Israel for their unbelief. Hebrews talks about that. They couldn't enter in because of their unbelief. So God did forgive them, but they still had to pay the consequences for their actions. Forgiveness is always a must, beloved. We remember the Sermon on the Mount where we have to, we have to forgive everything. And if you're not willing to forgive, pray for willingness to become willing to forgive. Start there. Okay, and forgiveness is always a must, and sometimes consequences are too. Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore will I bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. And the Lord said unto me, A conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So there's a secret conspiracy of boiling behind the scenes here against Jeremiah. And we do know that earlier in Jeremiah's life under Josiah, the good king, there were reforms and a reaction to the evil that occurred in the days of Jos jo uh, Josiah's predecessor, Manasseh. Okay? But even then, we infer from Jeremiah that there was a lot of secret resistance to the reforms, uh, to the reforms of, of Josiah, so that when these evil kings rose to power, it was very prevalent for them to return to idol worship. <clears throat> So there's another point I want to make, and it's about intimacy with Jesus. And I mean real intimacy and real closeness with him. It doesn't come just by osmosis or by being in a group of serious-minded Christians. We have to pursue Jesus like we would pursue a spouse. Okay? When you were dating your spouse, you were always thinking of how can I please him or her? Or we should be. Okay, If you're married, you should be. Okay, So that should never change, by the way. We should constantly be thinking this about Jesus. How can I please him? How can I please him in my thoughts, actions, passions, desires, wishes at work? How can I please him in my personal devotions? Am I being consistent and faithful in my personal private devotions? What about personal private Bible study? Okay. What about in my circle of friends and in satisfying my spouse? One cannot be right with God and not be satisfying their spouse in the three things that God's word says Spouses are to satisfy. God is the ultimate satisfaction. But there's three things spouses are to satisfy in their spouse. Communication, non-sexual affection, and sex. Okay. So all repentance and growth has to occur personally. Okay. Yes, God can bless a group, but each person has to choose to spend time with Jesus in his word. Okay. Paul said in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. For that to happen, we have to spend time in his word. So you'll remain a baby Christian if you don't spend time in God's word. This is Paul's point in, at the end of Hebrews chapter 5. So they, Judah, is being judged as a group, but it's very important to understand 
it's very important for us to recognize that God held each individual responsible and accountable for their own actions. Okay, so it may be tempting to feel far removed from Jeremiah's situation here, but I'm pretty sure none of the people uh, that are watching this video have a 40 foot wooden owl in their backyard that they burn incense to. <laughs> so, but we don't have to have physical idols in our possession. Anything can be an idol. Knowledge of the Bible can be an idol. It can be. It's not necessarily, but it can be. Okay, so can patriotism, sex, money, people, power, attention from others, belongings, cars, and so on. Anything can be okay, an idol in our life. Things we do for God can be an idol. We can get so wrapped up in the Lord's work that we forget the Lord of the work. Like the church at Ephesus, they lost their first love. They got so caught up in doing things for the Lord that they forgot the Lord. Okay, that's possible. That's a real danger for me and you. Okay, so we must keep our heart right. We must keep our heart right. That's our top stewardship in life is the stewardship of our heart. Okay, an idol is defined as anything we place above God in our lives. And all of us are subject to things that could displace God in our lives. We need to pray asking God's help in removing sinful things that are attractive to us, a desire or outright envy. Whatever the case may be, the living God is still in the heart transplant business. Praise God for that. The risen word justifies us, the written word sanctifies us, and the living word lives inside us. Verse 10. <clears throat> they are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refuse to hear my words. And they have went after other gods to serve them, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon them, and they shall not be able to escape. And though they cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Then shall the cities of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto the gods whom they offer incense, to whom they offer incense. But they shall not save them at all in the time of their trouble. For according to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, have you set up altars to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense unto Baal? So there's a play on words here in the Hebrew. The word shame and the word Baal, B-A-A-L, they sound almost the same in Hebrew. Baal and shame sound almost the same. Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them. For I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. So we're going to see Jeremiah really, really weep here because he's presiding over the death of his nation. He can see what's coming. He's a prophet and it's tearing him apart. Unlike Jonah, who didn't want the Ninevites to repent, didn't want to go deliver his message. Jeremiah is the opposite. He sincerely wants his people to repent. Okay. Jeremiah is watching Judah devolve into absolute destruction, just like me and you are watching the world devolve into absolute spiritual destruction. Okay. This is a heavy verse for Jeremiah. And it has major implications for us, too. Not just this verse, but the, the underlying message in what we're studying here. So three times Jeremiah gets this commandment from God in this book. God tells Jeremiah, pray not for this people. Okay? God said that he would hear their prayer because of their, God said that he would not hear their prayer because of their continued unbridled sin. Okay? So there's a group of Hebrew Christian scholars that very wisely point out, that until Israel acknowledges their rejection of Christ, their Messiah, and our Messiah, until they petition him to return and save them, okay, that Jesus is going to wait three days and then come and interrupt the battle that occurs at Basra to save them, okay? So Satan's working overtime to try to prevent God from carrying out his plan for Israel. If you remember Hosea 5.15, uh, the last verse of chapter 15, and then the first two verses of chapter 6, 5.15, 6, one and 6.2, is where God says, I will, Jesus said, I will go and return to my place till they uh, acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. Well, that's Jesus talking about once Israel acknowledging their offense, their offense there is singular. So that's that's talking about Israel's rejection of the Messiah, the, their, the uh, Jewish leadership's rejection of the Messiah. They were envious and jealous. Okay, it was the Jewish leadership that paid people to railroad Jesus and chant, crucify him, crucify him. Okay, that was not a consensus of all the people there at the foot of the cross. That was the consensus of the leadership. Okay, the ones that were jealous and intimidated by him. Okay, Satan's working overtime to try to prevent God from carrying out his plan for Israel. 
So what hath my beloved to do in my house, seeing she hath wrought lewdness with many, and the holy flesh is passed from thee? When thou doest evil, then thou rejoicest. The Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of a goodly fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he hath kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. So he's using several different idioms, the virgin, the house, the olive tree, and Paul picks up and runs with it, or picks this up and Paul picks this up and runs with it in Romans 11. So he's using several different idioms here, the virgin, the house, and the olive tree. And Paul picks this up and runs with it in Romans 11. Remember, Romans 9, 10, and 11 is Israel's past, present, and future. Okay, The whole concept of viewing Israel as the olive tree is what Paul picks up and runs with. Okay, Paul uses Jeremiah 11:16 as a springboard into the wild olive branch being, quote, grafted in. Okay, It's talking about Gentiles being grafted in. For the Lord of hosts that planted thee have pronounced evil against thee, for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to promote me, provoke me to anger in offering incense to Baal. So the house of Israel, if you remember, was the northern kingdom. There were many dynasties. They were destroyed in 722 by the Assyrians. That was the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom, which is where our focus is, is also called the Southern Kingdom. They only had one dynasty, which was the Davidic dynasty. And the Southern Kingdom is destroyed in Nebuchadnezzar's third siege that was in 586 BC and destroyed by Babylonian and or by Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. So God is saying that Judah will be judged for her sin too, but even more so, okay, more than the North was. So what does this mean for the United States? We're encouraged throughout the New Testament to pray for our leaders. Paul even told us to do so more than once. The greatest pain for God here seems to be ingratitude. Okay, what what was what is what can a, a parent do to a child that's ungrateful? Okay, how do you correct that? That's a heart issue. Going back to the heart. Okay, so after all God's done for Israel and Judah, and they don't even thank Him for what He did. Okay. He healed their families. He caused them to have good food. He took up for them and defended them against their militarily superior enemies numerous times. Okay, And they just walked away from him to go serve themselves. Okay, Instead of being grateful and showing gratitude to God, they were worshiping these wooden statues that couldn't do anything <laughs> that were nailed to the floor. And the Lord hath given me knowledge of it, and I know it. Then thou showest me their duty. So we talked about a broad conspiracy earlier, but here we have a very specific disaster. This is the very first major personal catastrophe in Jeremiah's life. Now, Jeremiah was an aggressive prophet of God, and it shouldn't surprise us that there were plots against his life. Okay, Anathoth was where Jeremiah was from. It was the home of the priestly house, Abiathar, who was a friend of David. But this house of priests was deposed by Solomon, who replaced it with the house of Zadok, okay, the high priest. So the priests of Anathoth were on the outs, if you will. Okay. Now we we can disagree with the man and his teaching, but trying to create a plot to kill him is going a little bit too far. Okay. That's what Jeremiah is facing here. But I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter, and I knew not that they had devised devices against me. Let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be no more, no more remembered. Well, their plan backfired because Jeremiah's name will be remembered in God's eternal preserved word forever. Okay, Remember Psalms 12, 6, and 7, where God promised to preserve his word forever. But, oh, but, O oh Lord of hosts, that judges righteously, that tries the reins and the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I revealed my cause. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, of the men of Anathoth that seek thy life, saying, Prophesy not in the name of the Lord, that thou die not by our hand. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword, and their sons and their daughters shall die by famine. And there shall be no remnant of them, for I will bring evil upon the men of Anathoth, even the year of their visitation. So even Judah will be judged and will go into captivity, but a remnant will return because of God's promise to David. But there will be no remnant from Anathoth, though. Okay? After the 70-year Babylonian captivity, a remnant of approximately 35,000 came back to the land. The rest of the Jews stayed in Babylon because things were really good for them. 
uh, they were technically in captivity, but they could still build houses and marry, get their sons and daughters in marriage. They could plant vineyards. They could basically live because God said, if you submit to Nebuchadnezzar, I'll see to it that you prosper. But if you don't, you're going to be killed. OK, so the people that obeyed, God took very good care of. So about 35,000 went back to the land. The rest stayed in Babylon. OK, so this was Jeremiah's first major personal crisis, but it gets worse for him uh, here as we go. So Jeremiah will complain to the Lord in a few chapters a little too harshly. And the Lord rebukes him, recommissions him. And from that time on, he never complains again. The Lord watches over Jeremiah through his entire ministry very closely. OK, but he still meets Jeremiah still meets stiff resistance all the way through, even though Josiah is somewhat friendly to Jeremiah. But King Josiah's second level staff headed in for Jeremiah. OK, they are rebellious and very much pro-Egypt. So the king's uh, second tier men, his lieutenants and all are pro-Egypt. They're encouraging Zedekiah to resist Nebuchadnezzar. And Jeremiah's trying to tell him if you resist, he's going to destroy you and, and burn the city to the ground, which is exactly what happened. So they try to do Jeremiah in. Chapter 12. So chapter 12 is going to bring up one of the most difficult things for a Christian to accept about living in this world. The prosperity of the wicked. Why do the wicked prosper? OK, they look like they never have a struggle. They have more money than they know what to do with. And this is a problem for a lot of people. OK, so this theme comes up a lot. It's the theme of David's Psalm 37. He said, fret not thyself, or don't worry thyself, because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord <coughs> and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evil doers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, but it shall not be. Or you'll look around for him, and he'll be dead and gone forever. So the rest of Psalm 37 is a really good read. David deals with the prosperity of the wicked. The theme of the prosperity of the wicked also comes up in Asaph's Psalm 73. The prophet Habakkuk deals with the prosperity of the wicked. So this shouldn't be too much of a problem for us because we have uh, passages like 2 Peter 2 and many others which show us exactly what's going to happen to the wicked people in the end. Peter says, 2 Peter 2, the first five verses, says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily or privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness, they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So it's clear to see that the wicked will be destroyed. Okay. Now in verse 3, what does it mean when it says to make merchandise of you? And through covetousness, they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you. Okay. That means to make money off you. Okay. Money on what? Okay. We, you have to follow the money, especially in a Christian organ, or quote, Christian organization, always follow the money. Okay. Devotional books get you out of God's word. Most of those devotional books have the verse typed in the book, which gets you out of God's word. So you, you end up never opening God's word because you have a devotional book with the scripture in it. Well, that defeats the purpose of devotions. The point of devotions is for you to be in God's word alone by yourself so God can speak to your heart. OK, Jesus said in Revelation 1, 3, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy talking about the Bible. OK, there 
Jesus said that he will bless us for just reading the text. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and do those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. So there's a promised blessing for just reading the text. Okay, having a book that's a devotional that gets you out of God's word completely defeats the purpose of devotions. So devotionals get you out of God's word and books with Bible on the cover. Okay, so they have to keep printing more and more new versions to keep you spending money. Okay, they have a financial interest. Okay, so and books called Bible. So they have to keep printing new versions, version after version to keep you spending money. Okay, they have a, a vested financial interest there. Okay, a lot of these organization, organizations own the copyrights. That's how they get paid. They keep putting out a new Bible with a new cover and they keep changing it. Okay. So if they agree that God preserved his word in one place, then you wouldn't have a need to buy a new Bible every couple of years or buy them as gifts or for yourself. Okay. So they got to keep you spending money on things you don't need. This is what Paul means when he says they'll make, or what Peter means when he says that they'll make merchandise of you. They will keep you spending money. Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Uh-oh. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that do very treacherously? Yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. It's like Jeremiah saying to the Lord, Lord, let's let's talk about this. <laughs> He's a, a little too bold, perhaps. Okay, Abraham was too in Genesis 18. If you remember, he bargains with God about the righteous possibility of righteous men in Sodom. And, our, and Abraham bargains with God. Do you remember that? Thou hast planted them, yea, they have taken root, they grow, yea, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth and far from their reins. So reins is talking about the heart here and talking about people that smile to your face but gossip about you behind your back. And gossip is a sign of a wicked, rebellious heart because they don't want to focus attention on themselves because they're inept. And it would be too painful for them to face the truth, so they make it about you. So... The Bible says in Proverbs 26, where no wood is, the fire goeth out. So where there is no talebearer or gossip, the strife ceaseth. What a great example. Where no wood is, the fire goeth out. So where there is no gossip, the strife ceaseth. But thou, O Lord, knowest me. Thou hast seen me and tried mine heart toward thee. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. So this is getting pretty graphic. How long shall the land mourn and the herbs of the field wither for the wickedness of them that dwell therein? The beasts are consumed and the birds because they said, he shall not see our last end. If thou hast run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trustest, they weary thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? In other words, if a little bit is good, then a whole lot is a lot worse for even thy brethren and the house of thy father even they have dealt treacherously with thee yea they have called the multitude after thee believe them not though they speak fair words unto thee okay this is about being deceived and jeremiah's really upset here a few verses ago jeremiah gets detached from a plot that included his family a plot to kill him that included his family so he knows the meaning of the word lonely I have forsaken mine house, I have left my heritage, I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. Mine heritage is unto me as a lion in the forest, it crieth out against me, therefore have I hated it. Mine heritage is unto me as a speckled bird, the birds round about are against her. Come ye, assemble all ye beasts of the field, come to devour. So the point he's making here that we might not be familiar with yet is that a bird will always attack a strange bird, okay? A group of birds will attack a bird that's different or that stands out, they'll attack it. He's pointing out that this bird is different so the other birds attack it. And Christians can be the same way, okay? Have you ever heard of tall poppy syndrome? So in a field, when one poppy is clearly taller than all the others, the other poppies will try to block the sun and eventually kill or try to harm to the point of killing the tall poppy, okay? They'll work together to try to destroy it. Okay, they envy Jesus too. 
Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. So these pastors and shepherds are the bad guys in this story, and not much has changed. This is an indictment on the leaders of Judah for allowing things to deteriorate so badly. Similar to today, where many pastors have deceitfully become rich off their biblically illiterate congregations. They want people in ignorance. They have a vested financial interest in doing so. These men take a paycheck from a congregation they have allowed to remain biblically illiterate, okay, just like the leadership in Judah is doing in our, in our text here. They have made it desolate, and being desolate, it mourneth unto me. The whole land is made desolate, because no man layeth it to heart. The spoilers are come upon all high places through the wilderness, for the sword of the Lord shall devour from one end of the land even to the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace. The sword of the Lord. Don't bring a butter knife to a sword fight. Beloved, make sure you have a paper Bible, not just digital ones. You can keep a written record in your paper Bible, but it's very hard to do with a digital one. Anytime God does something for you, it's always good to write it in the front or the back. Uh, so that way you've got a, a written record of it. If you keep a written record for a, about 30 days of everything God does for you, you're going to be blown away at how many things at the end of the month that we really don't think about that God does for us every day. When we woke up this morning, our arms and legs worked, our mind works. Well, that's debatable, but we hope that it works. Uh, our fingers and toes work. We can feel and see and enjoy pleasure. And we should be thanking God for these things and not taking these kind of things for granted. They have sown wheat, but shall reap thorns. They have put themselves to pain, but shall not profit. They shall be ashamed of your revenues because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord against all mine evil neighbors that touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit. Behold, I will pluck them out of their land and pluck out the house of Judah from among them. So this is the same theme that we've been talking about. This is anticipating chapters 47, 48, and 49, which goes into a lot more detail. And it shall come to pass, after that I have plucked them out, I will return and have compassion on them, and will bring them again, every man to his heritage, and every man to his land. So this is a promise that after Judah is judged, they will come back to their land or what's left of it. So God did judge Israel and remove them from their land, but God clearly brings them back to it. Okay, The second time, starting May 14th, 1948. And it shall come to pass, if they will diligently learn the ways of my people to swear by my name, the Lord liveth, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then shall they be built in the midst of my people. Diligently learn. Paul tells young Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed of biblical illiteracy, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you rightly divide the word of truth over time, you will not be biblically illiterate. God will give us diligence when we ask him and when we do what he says. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4.2, Moreover, it is required in stewards or ambassadors for Christ that a man or woman be found faithful. Okay, it's required. But if they will not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, saith the Lord. So a remnant is mentioned from Genesis 6 all the way to Revelation and everywhere in between. Okay, and we'll flesh this out as we go. So the same enemy of Judah is also going to destroy the other enemies of Judah, Syria, Moab, and Ammon, and others. So they'll be destroyed by the same Babylonian army God sent to judge the southern kingdom. If you notice in Scripture, when nations get away from God, God allows their enemies to defeat them. This has happened to every people group in history. Every people group has been defeated by their enemies because they got away from God, and God used their enemies to defeat them. Okay, What does that say for the United States? That terrifies me. Chapter 13. So chapter 13 has a very interesting event that has led to a lot of scholastic debate, and we'll take a look at what Jeremiah says and its implications. So it's an object lesson that's similar to what we find in Ezekiel and Zechariah, where the prophet's instructed to do something that has a message to it. Okay, Ezekiel had to lay on his side for a long time and then switch sides. Now this is purely symbolic. He actually did lay on his side, but this that was symbolic of something. Ezekiel did things publicly as a way to make an object lesson for the people to understand. Why'd he do that? He did it because God told him to. 
Thus saith the Lord unto me, Go and get thee a linen girdle, God tells Jeremiah, and put it upon thy loins, and put it not in water. So I got a girdle according to the word of the Lord, and put it upon my loins. And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, Take the girdle that thou hast got, which is upon thy loins, and arise, go to Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole in the rock. So I went and hid it by Euphrates, as the Lord commanded me. And it came to pass after many days that the Lord said unto me, Arise, go to Euphrates, and take the girdle from thence, or from there, which I commanded thee to hide there. Then I went to Euphrates, and digged, and took the girdle from the place where I had hid it. And behold, the girdle was marred, and it was profitable for nothing. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, So this girdle was wet, moldy, and it probably sank from being mildewed. Thus saith the Lord, After this manner will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. So God tells us why he had Jeremiah go hide and bury this girdle. It was because God was going to do the same thing to, quote, mar Judah and Jerusalem's pride, okay, that Jeremiah did to this girdle. So God was going to do the same thing to, to Judah and Jerusalem's pride that Jeremiah did to this girdle, okay? So verse 9 ties it all together. It says, after this manner will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. So what manner? The manner of they're going to be destroyed by those pagan invaders, okay, the Babylonians. This evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them, shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. So God said the people of Judah were like that moldy, stinky linen girdle. They were good for nothing. For as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for praise and for glory, but they would not hear. So God wanted the people to cleave to him, just like that linen girdle cleaved to Jeremiah's loins. And verse 11 indicates four things the Lord wanted. He wanted for them to be a people. He wanted for them to be a name for a praise and for a glory, but they would not hear. Okay, They didn't want anything to do with it. Okay. As much as he did for them, everything he did for them, and they turned their back on him and didn't want anything to do with him. But they would not hear. Sad indeed. Verses 12 through 14 use another idiom. Okay, it's a different expression. Okay, now to some, wineskins are considered jars. A uh, wineskin is, by most, is considered a 10 gallon jar. We wouldn't call a wineskin a jar because you can't set it up like a jar of peanut butter or a jar of orange juice. Or whatever. So either way, it was earthenware for wine storage. Verse 13. Therefore thou shalt speak unto them this word. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, every bottle shall be filled with wine, and they shall say unto thee, do we not certainly know that every bottle shall be filled with wine? So scholars have a problem here with the word Euphrates uh, in these verses. The Euphrates was hundreds of miles from where Jeremiah lived. So do we take the text literally, or was this a vision? Okay. Did Jeremiah actually travel hundreds of miles two different times to bury the girdle, and then once again to go retrieve the girdle? Was it really the Euphrates or not? Or was it intended that we think it was? Okay. So point number one, there was a lot of time in Jeremiah's ministry where he, there wasn't necessarily war. Okay. There was 19 years between the first and third siege of Nebuchadnezzar. OK, there were three major sieges and three major deportations or invasions. OK, as a result of those sieges. OK, that's when uh, the deportations of individuals took place. If you remember the first deportation, Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were deported. The second siege, Ezekiel was deported. The third siege, Jeremiah. OK, so there was a lot of time in between where there was peace in between the sieges where there was actual peace. Point number two is there is a lot of evidence that Jeremiah had errands to run and that he went to and fro from Babylon. That's possible because Jeremiah wasn't actually held in captivity. He was given great freedom uh, by Nebuchadnezzar himself. OK, so this, quote, hiding of the girdle may have occurred when he was on one of his errands or one of his trips. 
So not sure why there's so many theories about this, but I just want my students to have all the facts before drawing a conclusion. Because remember, God defines ignorance in Proverbs 18, 13 is drawing a conclusion without all the facts. We have to have all the facts, then draw a conclusion. So these are the possibilities. Okay, Some believe it was only a vision, which is an idiomatic way of communicating. So the whole point is that that which is going to spoil them came from Babylon. And the Euphrates is symbolic of Babylon. Okay, These linen garments were sometimes used as intimate undergarments. Okay, And they were symbolic of service to the priests. So in this case, they were unfit for service because they are, quote, marred. Okay, They, being Judah, are like a moldy, stinky, mildew, dirty undergarment that cannot be used anymore. Okay, That's the point. They became unusable. Paul calls this type of person a castaway. In 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul was worried himself about becoming a castaway. Okay, but they became unusable. They weren't in the beginning, but they became unusable. Okay, why were they moldy? They were moldy because of the influence of the Euphrates, i.e. Babylon and idolatry. Okay, so we can build a house on this. OK, linguistically, Euphrates acts like a pun. The concept of Euphrates is all through here. So verse nine ties this all together. Remember, verse nine said, thus saith the Lord, after this manner, will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem by using by using pagan invaders, which was Babylon. OK, as God's instrument of judgment, that was the this manner. That's what this manner means when it says after this manner, will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem by using pagan invaders. That was Babylon. Verse 13, then shalt thou say unto them, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of this land, even the kings that sit upon David's throne and the priests and the prophets and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with drunkenness. So there's four groups of people singled out, kings, priests, false prophets, and the people. So this anticipates a lot that will happen in chapters 25 and 51. And I will dash them one against another, even the fathers and the sons together, saith the Lord. I will not pity nor spare nor have mercy, but destroy them. Hear ye and give ear. Be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. Beloved, we're going to leave it here uh, for part six. We'll catch the rest up in part seven. Thank you so much for hanging in there with me. I love you. Please remember me in your prayers. Please pray for Scott Whitley and for Faithful Work Ministries. Pray that God will provide the right amount of resources. If anything, please remember me in your prayers every day. Put me on a sticky note if you have to. Please pray for me. Thank you so much for your time and attention. We'll catch you in the next video. God bless and I love you.